Welcome to the Weekly Juice Podcast, where we discuss all things real estate, personal finance, investing, entrepreneurship, and the many ways to achieve financial independence. We interview accomplished investors and entrepreneurs with the goal that their stories inspire you to take control of your financial future. Here to get your creative juices flowing while also documenting their own personal investing journeys are your hosts, Corey Jacobson and Ryan Bevilacqua. Welcome back to the Weekly Juice. As always, it's your boys Ryan and Corey here with another episode for you. Today, we're very excited to bring on one of our previous guests and really good friends, Sean Winslow. You probably heard his episode almost exactly a year ago to the date. Um, we had him on the show to walk us through his, his portfolio back then. We're going to fast forward to now, bring him back on. He is the founder and managing partner of Greenbrier Capital. He has a portfolio of about 27 long-term units. And then he's also syndicated about 10 plus big apartment complexes, multifamily deals. He has those in Georgia, North Carolina, and New Hampshire. But this guy is an absolute stud. He's about 35 in his mid-30s and just absolutely killing it. I love Sean. And we've been talking to him for, uh, like you said, about a year. We interviewed him about a year ago. And we've really just, like, vibed with him. We've kind of bonded. We have a group chat. We uh, we Now we literally talk every day. Like, he's become one of our good friends. Um, but first of all, it's, the, it's really the morals of Sean that we really align with. And another exciting part about this is that we've been building our network. We've been trying to partner with other people and the right people on deals. And finally, we have a deal to talk about to bring to light. So, yes, we're thrilled about it. As you guys have heard us talk in multiple episodes previously, that we are trying to expand our portfolio, expand our network. And for us, we found a perfect partner. As we kind of mentioned briefly, is that we did a courtship for about over a year and we talked with Sean. We met all of his other partners in the company and we talked deal by deal and, and said, hey, is this the right person for us? Obviously, we like the guy, right? But is this the right person that we want to do business with in the future? And you know, throughout the year, certain deals came up, certain ones we decided to pass on. And we finally came upon this deal that we'll talk about later in the episode that we're looking to bring partners in on. And with that, it's not going to be the first deal that we do this with. So Corey and I decided it would be a good idea to start getting the, uh, the system going here and getting everybody involved that wants to be involved. I know we talk about adding real estate to people's portfolio for their financial picture. And that's what we've done to kind of inch our way towards financial independence. So with that, we'd love to chat with people. So we put a questionnaire in the link in our bio. So most of you are probably already following us on Instagram. If you're not, our handle is at weekly juice pod. You'll click the link in our bio. And then the first link is an investor questionnaire. And it'll take you probably maybe less than three minutes to fill out. And that whether you're accredited or not accredited, Definitely fill out the form. This specific deal that we're going to be talking about in the episode today is specifically for accredited investors only. However, we still want to chat with you if you're not accredited because maybe you will be one day and there's other deals that might come up in the future that we don't want you left out on. Yeah. And as you listen to this episode, you'll you'll hear Sean's story. It's a really cool story of somebody who I, I mentioned it in the actual show that he like basically skipped 10 years of like the tr- the typical timeline that most people take from going to like from small multifamily to large multifamily. He just said, I'm going to go, I'm going to take my small 27 units small, which is bigger than what we have, right? But And then I'm going to jump right into the syndications. And he dove right in. And by the by the time he's in his mid-30s, he's a, a millionaire a couple times over. <laughs> and he's like, he's truly crushing it. So as you talk about, as we go through the first maybe half of the episode, it's really recapping Sean's story. And then the second half of the episode, stick around for it because that's where we really dive into the deal and something that we're really excited about. Couldn't agree more. And I know you mentioned, you said he like skipped 10 years and it was all because of the relationships he built. And we know we keep pushing this is like surround yourself with the right people, join a mastermind, get around people that are looking to do things you're doing. He did exactly that. And that's kind of helped scale him exponentially. So I don't want to give away the full story now in the intro, but without further ado, let's bring back in our friend, Sean. Sean, officially welcome back to the show, man. We are so excited to have you. Um, I think it's a long time coming. We had you on the show probably about a year ago. And we wanted to bring you back to chat through your story, talk about some exciting projects we have upcoming. But uh, here's your warm welcome back to the show, man. Ryan, Corey, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be back. And uh, like last time, let's have some fun again. We're thrilled to have you, Sean. So if you could take us through your journey into real estate investing and kind of bring us to the state of your portfolio today. Yeah, of course. A little refresher for those that heard the last episode. So I won't go into as much details last time. 
um, but definitely definitely new for for our new listeners here. So, yeah, man, I grew up in a small town in Vermont to a family of entrepreneurs, and at first I took that journey right. So, for those of you that are fil- are familiar with the uh, East Coast, we get snow. So, I did both lawn care, so, so mowing lawns and snow removal because we get that that white stuff up here. Um, right, you did that too, right? Yeah, it's your yeah, thing, landscaping, bro. all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah man. So that that was the first uh, kind of itch of the the entrepreneurial bug, because um, it first started off. I wanted to buy a new mountain bike, and and luckily I had parents that that wouldn't just you know get that for me. They they instilled um, what hard work can provide. So worked my butt off to buy that mountain bike, and then afterwards I was like, oh man, I don't have any more money. And so it, it it taught another lesson that it's you know money is fleeting and 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 material is just that's what it is. So, um, but anyways, then I went to uh, school because like most people, I was con- I was conditioned by society, right? So I didn't really continue on that entrepreneurial journey right out of the gate. Um, went to Boston University, studied finance, and then pursued a career in finance in Boston um, for was in Boston for almost twelve years. And yeah, just like most people, I was, you know, conditioned to do that. And, and don't get me wrong. It was, um, an invaluable experience, you know, learned the corporate world, um, learned finance obviously, and made a lot of great connections. So I wouldn't trade it for the world, but just like, I'm sure you hear a lot of guests say they'd wish they'd started earlier in real estates. And I agree, but, um, I do have some invaluable experience from my, from the world of finance. And to your question about the real estate thing, it always had been in the back of my head for a multitude of reasons. One is, you know, growing up, I saw wealthy people in my town. They were real estate investors. Um, my grandfather once told me that, you know, his retirement would be paid by the real estate he owned. And that just always put a you know light bulb in my head. And then the third thing was when I was working for finance and things just weren't aligning in terms of, of values and really what I wanted out of life and... I just came to the conclusion that this isn't the best investment vehicle for my clients, for our clients, and it just didn't sit right. So I decided to do a little brainstorming, right? What do I want in life? I I didn't want to just change careers just to do it, to get out of that position. I really wanted to, you know, design the life I wanted and then choose a career that would fit that. And so the two things I wanted were, you know, time, time to do the things that I wanted with the people I wanted when I wanted. And obviously that takes money to do that. So the two things I needed were time and money, a flexible schedule and money to do the things I wanted to do. And so I looked like, who do I know in my circle um, or just successful people in general that had those two things? And more often than not, they were in real estate. So I took, I decided to take the plunge and and I'll stop for here guys, if you want to, you know, ask some questions. Yeah, no, that's great, man. Thank you for sharing. I mean, the people that were listening to the episode previously, they've maybe heard some of this, but I'm curious, like if you want to do a, a deep dive or, or, or surface level dive, but just like into your personal portfolio, what you did in the first few years of growing it, and then kind of walk us to where you are today with your portfolio and what you do with Greenbrier. Yeah. Um, so when I decided to make the change, I think I was still in that mindset that, you know, conditioned by society that to do anything you need to get educated like formally educated um so what i ended up doing was boston university has a night program that's highly respected by the local real estate investment firms in boston um it's a real it's called the Re- boston university's real estate finance program real original title um but uh that's what i did so i did that nights after work for i think it was about a year and a half um and that's when I found the world of syndications. Um, and someone else who was in the program was actually working for one of the larger syndicators in Boston. He was taking this program to actually get out of syndications and get more into formal private equity real estate. And I was like, all right, man, you're trying to get out of that. That's the thing I want to do. And so I just went head first into the world of syndications and just educated myself, you know, University of Google, Uni- University of YouTube, just educated myself. Right. And, but I still had, you know, limiting beliefs. I still didn't think I could do it right out of the gate. I felt like I needed experience. I needed my own capital, um, needed to be a little older. You know, I just felt like the, you know, only the people with the gray hairs are doing this. Right. 
which is completely BS. Um, but at the time, that's what I thought. So I continued to ed educate myself and decided that I would just grow a, a portfolio of smaller multis along the way. Um, so we got that up to about 27 units, um, personal portfolio. And that's when I decided that I just needed to go over this mental hurdle. I'd heard other people were doing it. Um, and I had reached out to uh, who I wanted to be a mentor, right? Um, and I, I feel that's important. And someone who you are looking for a mentor, I don't think it should just be because they're making a lot of money. Um, I think it should be they're living the life you want in the future, both from a business standpoint and a personal standpoint. And so that's what I looked for. And from my career in finance, you know, I learned that the best best way to reach people is to the old fashioned way is to write a handwritten letter and mail it to them because they're getting inundated with calls and emails every day. And that's just a great way to stand out. So that's what I did to this individual. He called me immediately and was impressed, said that was his trick. That's what he did. So he connected on that. And I used that mentor to get into the, into syndications. And since then we've done, um, well, by the end of the year, we'll be close to 500 units. Um, we have over 519 student housing beds. And that's what we do now with Greenbrier. Um, and so I had to leave my job because I was in that job. It, it would have been a conflict of interest, right? Because I'm raising money for our funds at that firm. I couldn't then raise money for a Greenbrier Capital Group. Um, so I had to leave. And luckily, I had those 27 units that could help with that blow, you know, cushion me a little bit. And so that's that's when I took the plunge. And Green Bar is all about um, improving the li lives that it comes into, into contact with. And that's just not, um, you know, investors. It's, you know, the residents that live at our properties. It's the staff that works at our properties, works for our company. And then obviously our investors and our partners. And, yep. and, that, and that's what we do. Well, Sean, we've got to know you really well over the last year and a half, two years, and we vibe really, really well. We're in the, around the same age, but all in our uh, low, um, uh, early thirties. I always used to say late twenties, and like those days are those days of sales. Yeah, we're up. old men. We're <laughs> old men. So early thirties, and what you did, Sean, is you actually expedited. You basically shaved ten years off of what normal, normal. I say normal, but most real estate investors do. They build this portfolio. 40, 50, 60 units, and they're like, oh, damn, now I should think about syndications because I ran out of money and I have cash flow coming in. And sure, I don't have to have a full time job, but it's like, if I really want to scale, 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 I need to go into syndications. But you did this in your early 30s. So you're really smart. We know that. But I just want to commend you for that and the ability to grow quicker. So for people that don't know, and, and a lot of people listening do, but what is a syndication? How does it work? Just give us the 30, 60 second spiel on that just so that people are understanding like maybe what we're going to talk about later in the episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll break this into two parts. I'll do this really simple, um, kind of definition. And that's think of back to grade school. You wanted to buy your teacher a gift. You couldn't afford it by yourself. So you got all your classmates to chip in and buy the gift. That's essentially what a syndication is. I love that. Yeah. That, was, <laughs> that was easy as a third grader. That was great. That was yeah. You have a bunch of people chipping in to buy, not a gift, I guess you could call it a gift, but uh, an apartment building, right? Um, or it could be any type of real estate. And so the more technical definition is um, under the SEC, the Securities Administration, you have to register a security um, by law. However, there is you know, exemptions to register security, and some of them are call, called Regulation D. Um, and that's essentially what a syndication or a private placement is. Um, there's two main ones, 506B and 506C, and we can get into that if you want, but um, a syndication is raising money legally um, through an exemption to the, the securities law. Cool. And in the syndications, the distinction, we don't have to go all the way in the details, but the distinction between a 506B, where you can raise money, friends and family, the investors don't need to be accredited, and a 506C, where the investors need to be accredited. So- to, to market the deal. To market the deal, exactly. To talk about it and, and um, to show other partners what you're looking to do. So what is an accredited investor? We've talked about it on our show, but I'd love to hear from you. Just so people that are listening are like, oh, I, maybe I do qualify for this. I didn't even know it. Yeah. Um, so the definition by the SEC is a accredited investor is someone who has either uh, made 
$200,000 in the last two years with a reasonable expectation they're going to make it this year. Um, or if you file jointly with a spouse, that, that number goes up to 300000 Or you have a, a, a liquid net worth um, or a, a net worth of a million dollars minus your primary residence. So, you can't count. so in layman's terms, essentially, if if I've made two hundred grand on my tax return the last two years, and I have that's if I file single, and I have a million dollars of net worth, or or if I have a million dollars net worth minus the equity in my home, my private home, I would qualify. Yep. And then if I file jointly with my spouse, if we both made three hundred grand together the last two years, or together we had a million dollars of net worth minus our the equity in our home, we would qualify as a credit investor. Yeah, correct. Excellent. Awesome. Thanks. So, Sean, let's talk about the deals that you've syndicated before. Uh, this is not your first rodeo. We're going to be talking about a specific deal as we get later in the show, but you've done a number of these and successfully. So just give us like a high level overview of some of the deals you've done, the ones you've syndicated specifically, and just maybe where they are, the size, any details that you want to share. Yeah, I'll talk about three um, three of them that we've done. Uh I think we need a whole episode to get in to, to every single one. Um, uh, first one was a 14 unit, so on the smaller side. It was in New Hampshire. Um, smaller raise, I think it was around uh, 400 grand around um, raise. And yeah, it's a solid deal. Found that. Um, actually bought a smaller multi. That was when I was when I was buying my smaller portfolio and then just asked the seller if he had any more and he actually had yeah, 14 more um, units. And he was looking to offload them, but he was just going to market it. And I just told him I would scoop it up. So that's how we got that one. Um, the next was 197 units in Georgia, um, traditional multifamily. And yeah, we took that down in 2021. Um, the raise on that was 5.6 million. And then the next one following that was a student housing um, 165 units, um, Radford, Virginia, and that was a $7.2 million raise. Now, if you guys want to ask me questions, you get any more specifics? So... <laughs> yeah, I got a lot now. Yeah, that, that's exciting. Sorry, well, I think you've done, you've done well over 10 of these big syndication deals, right? We obviously have to have a full episode for this, but those three are cool. And it, I want to talk about, I'll, I'll just address it as Greenbrier, right? The company that you guys run and that kind of takes these things down. Can you talk to what you guys specifically look for in these type of deals? And then, you know, maybe why you pick certain areas of the country to go in? Yeah, definitely. So I think that's that's where we started first. When we, we first got started, we took the approach of building relationships with brokers, so commercial brokers. Um, we weren't really going to do the whole off-market thing. Um, I think that it works really well in the small to mid multi game. Um, can it work in the in the big big boy the big unit game of course it can it's just not as effective about 90 95 plus percent of of the bigger units when i say bigger you know 80 80 to 100 plus units those are you know again 90 to 95 percent plus of those are traded by brokers um so i just figured out go in the the pond with the most fish right and so what i did is first well, okay, there's so many bro markets, so many brokers within, within each market. Let's kind of just focus it down to a few markets and then build really strong relationships with those brokers. Um, and so what I did is one of our lenders um, has a research arm and and they compile a bunch of data um, from all, all commercial real estate asset classes. And so I asked them for a list in our markets of all the brokers that were, were actively doing business because I didn't want to waste a lot of time with guys that weren't doing a lot of a lot of the volume. And so I would just hit that list. And how I got to the markets, which I probably should have led with, um, is we looked at population growth. We looked at um, income growth. We looked at home value growth. We looked at job growth. We looked at crime rate. And those were all over, you know, a 10 to 20 year period. We wanted to see steady increase in, in all those factors. Um, and then we'd look at stuff like U-Haul data to really see, you know, net net migration. And then when we really got into the neighborhood, it was a lot about, you know, crime. Obviously, you got to go there to see how it feels because you can look at all the data you want, but you got to go there. You, you really know what a market in the neighborhood's like when you're, you know, standing there. You feel comfortable, right? 
Um, and I always recommend going at night. So anytime we go to look at a property, we'll fly in the night before we're going to meet the broker and we'll drive the property that night to really get a feel because it's a completely different vibe. Everyone's home. You know, what do you got? A lot of loitering, a lot of soliciting, like what's what's going on? Um, so that's that's really important to do that. Um, and so, yeah, we compile all this data and we get in the neighborhood and there's <laughs> one other thing we look at is I call it my like Chick-fil-A tracker um, because we try to get a property and these are more in the southern southern states. The northern states don't really apply because there's not as many uh, Chick-fil-A's, uh, at least in a concentrated area. But we look to be within one to th- one, maybe to three miles of a Chick-fil-A because, hey, look, Chick-fil-A is a big company. They're one of the most, actually, they're the, the most profitable franchise in the United States and one of the fastest growing. They have. A- I did not know that. The most yeah. profitable. Yeah. I was going to go right to Starbucks, dude, because no. lot, I've, I've heard the same thing and people are like, hey, I'll- Starbucks. Starbucks not we look at we look at both um but Chick-fil-A is clearly doing something right you know they have they have a team that researches where should the next location be so they've obviously put in a lot of money and man hours to to determine this is a great spot and everyone loves Chick-fil-A too if you can walk to Chick-fil-A from your apartment or a Starbucks you know that's that's money um like that Georgia property I remember it's the 100 reference the 197 unit it's um a three it's a three minute drive and a 12 minute walk to the Chick-fil-A. And that's one of our prop- properties that is doing the best. So not that it's 100% correlated, but, you know, there's something sure. there. Yeah, yeah, we're not saying, hey, go, yeah, yeah, yeah drop yeah. a pin on a Chick-fil-A, buy a place next door. Yeah. That is a cool barometer outside of yeah. all the other data that you pulled, the economic factors. I also want to talk about, and I know this is part of your research too, is like, we talk about all the student housing beds you have. Can you talk about like location by university? Because I know that I don't want to give away too much of your secret sauce here. Not no, Chick-fil-A no, sauce, right. but go yeah, ahead. Chick- that was a good one. <laughs> Love me some Chick Fil A sauce. Uh, yeah, so um, we student housing compared to multifamily. Multifamily is you're really looking at the market, the neighborhood. Um, of course, you're looking at that in student housing, but you're more of underwriting the the university, the college, right? Because you don't want a college where tu- tuition uh, or excuse me, enrollment has been declining over the past five, ten, whatever years, right? You want to see um, either, you know, growing or maintaining you know, or growing at a, a small rate. You know, you want to see that because, I mean, it's a health university. Obviously, the big names, we we know those. Um, but you're obviously going to pay a premium for you, for student housing at, at, at those institutions. But you really want to underwrite um, the school. And you also want to see that there's a mix um, of offerings, right, of, of degrees. You don't, you don't necessarily want it to be... 100% contra- concentrated on one degree, unless it's, you know, sometimes you'll get like a nursing school that's really known for that and it's been around for decades. And, and, and that could be an exception. Um, but if it's, you don't, you just don't want to concentrate in one, you know, one degree. Cause what if, what if the institution that supports that degree leaves, right? So we want a healthy mix. Um, so those are kind of some of the things we look at at student housing. We also look at how close it is to the campus. The closer you are, the better, right? If, if they can walk, that's, you know, that's really important. Or if it's on the bus route, even better. Very cool. Cool. So it's funny, as you were talking about this, Sean, uh, I don't, not to switch tracks at all, I want to talk about the the, the purpose of the value add and everything too. it. I was looking, uh, and our, our first podcast, what we did, it was um, the 27th of July. That's when it released, uh, t- 2022, which means we were likely recording a couple weeks before, which, so one year, and part of that is like to, to talk about you know, the partnership that we have and the hours and hours of talking on Zoom and going back and forth via text to learn about your business and what you do. It's just been awesome. And that's part of the, like the whole partnership that we want to talk about. But I, I was, I just couldn't help myself. I was trying to, for people that were like curious of when Sean was on, it was a, it was almost exactly a year ago. And we've known him for, for longer than that too. So not to, to break this up, but I just thought that was an interesting note. Um, I want to talk before we get into the more specifics of of the deal that we're talking about. Like, talk about the value add and how that's like a big part of your portfolio and a big part of what you look for. And what is maybe some strategies high level that you use to to try to buy price uh, properties undervalued. Yeah, yeah, great question. I'm sure the listeners that you know listen or read a lot of stuff about multifamily have probably heard this a bunch, and that's uh, a va- value add you know multifamily deal. And what that is, is you're, you're finding a property, you know, we usually look for two things, you know, 
um, deferred maintenance. So meaning just the property has not been taken care of by current owner or previous owners and poor management. Those are the two things we look for. And if they have both, even better, because you're going to buy it at a discount most likely, and you're going to be able to, to for what we call force appreciation, drive a lot of value, especially in a market like now where rates have been rising. You know, the Fed, you know, indicated the other day that they're probably going to raise again. Um, you know, you can't just, in this type of market, you can't just bank on just raising rents without doing anything or bank on appreciation in asset value. Can it happen? Of course, but you can't bank on that. And if you are, uh, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. And if if your investors that are going to invest in that type of deal, please, please do not, please stay away. It's got to be something where you know you can create appreciation no matter what the market is doing. And that's what we look for. So we come in, you know, it's got deferred maintenance, so we know we can fix up the property, clean it up, make it look really nice, really inviting to future residents. Um, poor management, we can increase that. One thing we look for is we look for um, the Google star rating, the reviews. If it's below a three, we love that because that means we can create value and then push that star rating up because that's what everyone looks for now, right? You look for a restaurant, you look for an apartment, whatever it is, um, you're going to look what's, you know, what's the reviews and how many reviews are there. So these are all things we look for because when we're coming in, when you're in a rising interest rate environment, you know, we want to be able to force appreciation. So we want to come in and see, okay, the rents are below market, quality of the property is not great, and it's just really poor management. We come in and improve those things. So when you talk about driving the value up, and I know there's um, a lot of different things you can do, but is it as simple as, and I hate to say lipstick, right? Because when I think of that, I think of, hey, you just need new floors, they need yeah. maybe new paint, maybe new fixtures. Every deal is probably different, but do you guys go through and evaluate every single unit by unit before you ta decide to purchase a property? Like how do you, in your walkthrough, how are you guys deciding, hey, I think it's going to cost me this much and I think this is exactly what we're going to do to it. What's your guys kind of like plan of attack when you go into it? Yeah. So when we first look at a property, we probably won't be able to see every unit um, just because, you know, the owner doesn't want inconvenience the, the, the residents until they have a signed, you know, purchase and sale agreement, but we'll try to see as much as we can. We'll get a feel for, you know, what the classic units look like, what the, their upgraded units look like and how much, you know, what we're going to have to do. And then we have, you know, contractors in these markets or either that, or we've been doing these upgrades. So we kind of know what the market number is on all these things. So then we can go back, calculate what it's going to cost per unit to do that. How much exterior work do we need? Um, but then once we get into due diligence, after we've signed a contract with a seller, then yes, we it's it's in our contract. We have to have access to every single unit, and then we walk every single unit. Um, you know, we come in. It, it's it's all organized. You come in. You take a picture of the front door with the unit number, and then you go in and take pictures of unit all around every room. Um, get the condition, and then you know go on to the next unit and take take that picture of that front door. So then all the pictures are back ended by front door. So you really organized. And we go back, analyze all that, and see what we really need um, to imp improve these uh, units. And then we'll also calculate because sometimes it's not always your best, you know, investment to fully renovate every single unit. We'll look, we'll try to get. Well, I mean, we will calculate the return on investment. So if we're putting in, you know, say five thousand dollars a unit, you know, for like a mid-level, you know, renovation, we go anywhere from three to probably. 10 to 15, depending on the, on the quality. And we'll say, okay, if we're putting in that much, how much rent can we actually increase? And is it worth it? You know, we like to see 30% return on investment um, for the money we put into the rent bump, we can get 30 plus. Um, you know, if it's 2025, we'll, we'll still probably consider it. But if it's anything below that, most likely not. It's just not worth, worth the, the time and the headache. That's a great segue here because all the things that you mentioned, Sean, are kind of leading us up to this deal that we're really excited about that we wanted to, to talk about here. Um, it, let's just discuss this. We're actually looking for partners for the deal too, which is really exciting. It's it's an 18 unit up in Manchester, New Hampshire, which is right in your backyard essentially. And uh, I think there's a lot of things we should talk about and we'll start with just the economics of the deal itself. Why we Take us through the top, right? How you found the yeah. deal, how you 
kind of underwrote it, right? Like why you think there's a value add proposition here. And then talk about Manchester itself, why the area and kind of how this fits your buy box for your portfolio. Yeah, definitely. Uh, first off, excited to partner with you guys. As Corey mentioned, we've kind of kind of been like a courtship for over a year and a lot of values align with us and, and we just have a good time together. So yeah, super excited to partner with you guys. And the deal itself, um, yeah, in Manchester, New Hampshire, for those of you who aren't familiar, is the largest city in the state of New Hampshire. And first, we love we love New Hampshire, right? Our, our main markets in Greenbrier are North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And then New Hampshire, because that's where I first started uh, growing my small multi-portfolio. And I also have family there, so it just makes sense. But the market is really strong. It has, the state of New Hampshire has a vacancy rate of 0.5%. Um, I didn't miss say that, 0.5%. Anyone that's familiar with vacancy rates knows that a healthy market has you know, 5%. That's what um, economists use. That's what the Fed uses. That's the rate they want to be at. They want to be at 5%. So you can see there's a long way to go to get that in New Hampshire. And in Manchester specifically, it's 0.4%. Um, and so the question might be, well, what's the pipeline look like? And for those that aren't familiar with the term, it's essentially what's what's on deck for new construction. And it's, it's relatively small to non-existent in New Hampshire because it's really hard um, from a permitting standpoint, um, from you know a density loss standpoint to get, to get anything going. And it's also really expensive to build in the Northeast, both from material and labor perspectives. So the pipelines are not really there. So there's huge demand. And on top of that, people are moving into the state for many reasons, beautiful state, obviously, more seasons, you know, a lot of out cool outdoor stuff to do. No, no income tax, no sales tax. So it's from a trust standpoint, people also like they're, they're really good trust laws. So there's a lot of great things why people are moving in, and businesses are moving in, but the housing makes it difficult, right? Some people even end up not even be able to find anything or have to pay pay more than you know anticipated. And this makes a very healthy market for real estate investors, multifamily investors for these factors. And we're also established here. We have a longstanding relationship with our property management company who um, operates and manages all of our properties. And this this deal, this 18 unit in the heart of Manchester, New Hampshire was brought to me by my property management company. Um, we're on a phone call going over our existing portfolio. And I always ask, at the end of every call, I always ask, hey, is there anything out there to buy right now? You, you got anything? And he said, actually, something just hit my, my email today, an 18 unit. You want to take a look? I said, of course. And it happened to be a property he had just took over. Um, the, the current owner had bought it last year in 2022 and just had a hard time with it, couldn't find the right property management company, went through two and finally found the one um, that we use and they actually got it back on track and it's, it's doing great now. So, uh, you know, curious if, if they're regretting the money to sell, but either way we have it under contract and we're getting it for a discount, probably 10 to 12% discount from market, maybe even more than that. But as Corey and Ryan know, it appraised for more than we're buying it for by a decent amount. Let's talk about a little bit more. I will, well, at least I want to touch on this. I really like the fact that it's so close to Southern New Hampshire university. We talked about a bunch of different areas that you're invested in. We talked about potential for student housing. I think there's a lot of different plays here. Um, I don't know that we'll directly go into the student housing student housing play, but it's a, it's a backup, right? And yeah, um, you talked about all the commerce. That's uh, there's a couple blocks away. There's a park lined up right, literally as you walk out the front door, you swing to the left. There's a park right right to the corner, kind of behind the uh, the property, which is very cool for us. Um, and so. I think we should talk about the plan of attack, right? So you got, you just mentioned you got it at a discount and which is like leg up right away. But what do you see, foresee this kind of unfolding as the whole kind of blueprint for this? Yeah. So the plan is we're going to come in. And again, this is what I mentioned before. This is a value add type deal. So we're going to come in, improve the units. Um, so that's new flooring and, and it all depends on the unit. Like I mentioned before, uh, the, uh, the flooring, the paint, lighting, cabinets when needed, uh, countertops when needed, fixtures when needed, come in, really make it inviting, 
clean up the hallways, new paint, new flooring roll needed, new lighting to really brighten it up. Again, make it inviting. But security cameras on the outside, everyone likes that. New lights, light it up like a Christmas tree so it feels safe at night. Landscaping, it's all about curb appeal. And we come in and we do the exterior stuff first. That's something that we always do because you can start with the the units where you're going to get all the ROI, but it doesn't really create any buzz outside. Everyone driving by just doesn't realize you're doing anything. It just looks like the same old property. So if you start with the exterior first, it creates some buzz and people are like, oh, what's going on there? I guess someone's finally putting money into this thing. And then it, you know, piques their interest. And then we go into the units. Um, so that's how, that's how we do it. And, and we're not just, again, it's all about ROI. So why we're able to do this is we're able to get three to five hundred dollars and in increase in, in each unit per month. That's a big number. Um, so that that's another thing that really piqued my interest when this deal was brought to me. Not only is I'm getting it for it, we're getting it for a discount, but the the rent increases we can get. And so that's the main plan. It's it's pretty easy. We've done this countless times. Um, we've worked with this team countless times. So we're kind of like a well-oiled machine and we're just really excited to get this started very cool thanks for the breakdown yeah we're excited as well and uh the fun part is we're actually able to offer this to to accredited investors and we're looking for additional partners to jump in the deal with us so we mentioned what an accredited investor was earlier on the show i can recap it right now um if you've made two hundred thousand dollars if you're filing your taxes singly for the last two years you can show it on your tax return or you have a million dollars in net worth excluding the equity in your home then you're a credit investor. And if you file jointly with a spouse or it's $300,000 combined for the last two years, you're showing on your tax return or together you have a million dollars net worth outside the equity of your single family home. So then you would qualify. We, uh, we put together uh, an investor questionnaire because we want to get people involved here. And whether it's for this deal, future deal, just want to open up. We're going to have some things coming up in the future. We figured we'd start here. But if you click the link in our bio, on what it's yeah on instagram at weekly juice pod is our handle so uh, most of you guys follow us from there but if not definitely give us a follow and you'll see the first link in the link tree and it's a quick questionnaire it'll take you five minutes also we'll leave it in the show notes as we wrap up the show and uh we look forward to kind of starting there and once we get all the responses back we'll go through it comb through and then we will uh, likely email out with our calendly link to book a time for us three to chat and we can see if it's the right fit yeah, and another thing to mention here is that Ryan and I have interviewed, um, you, this is a, episode 169, I believe. So we've had interviews with 160 plus investors, and we're not saying that we've had the opportunity to part with all, partner with all of them because we haven't pursued that, but there's a select few people that we'd want to go into business with and just the morals, the values, the vision, what do we want our future life to look like? And I felt like that you and I, agreed on that and, and Sean kind of fit in that. So if anybody was wondering like how do we even decide to do this partnership, it really has a lot to do with less about the real estate, which is great. That's an awesome deal, but more so about the the part the the feeling, the the morals, the connection and the brotherhood, if you will, just that we feel as we grow our our relationship. Sure. Yeah. I think it's it's definitely important to bring that up. It, Sean kept saying and I thought it was funny, he called it a courtship. But we really did honestly, we had calls almost every other week. We were on Zooms, texting, and I, I feel like we've just created like a little family over the last year, which is awesome. Then brought his partner Tucker in involved and just it's it's been great. So I think for people we mentioned to get involved with masterminds and like surround yourself with people that want to do the things you're doing and you get elevated to that level. For us with Sean, it's more so getting around someone that th thinks like we do, a little bit more analytical, but gets us excited and there's deal flow. And there's just so many things that we align on and our personal values. And it's not just, hey, we're going to work every day. So we're super excited to partner with you, Sean, if you can't tell. I know you mentioned it. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely uh, reciprocal here. So we're it's, me it's mutual, guys. And, and thanks for the kind words. And one thing I'll add to what you guys mentioned is... If you, whether you've done a syndication or not, to me, the most important thing, obviously you got to do due diligence on the, the property, the offering, but I think it's more important to do due diligence on the sponsor or the operator. Um, and that's what they did with me. I think that's the most important thing in, in a syndication is obviously their track record. That's important, but also do you align, um, do your objectives align, do your morals align, do your values align? Cause you're, it's to use courtship again, it's essentially a you know, it's a partnership for, you know, 
five years, you know, anywhere from three to seven is is usually an average syndication. So you got to make you got to do diligence and make sure you align. Yes, and to top that, to, to kind of weave into that as well, you do business with people you know, like, and trust, right? Everyone hears that, but it is so true. And I know we talked about the, I guess, like the sexy aspect of it, right? Like the, the friendship aspect, if you will, right? But the year was us doing our due diligence on you, on the business, talking about your previous deals. Like we dissected everything. Then we asked you to bring in other partners, talk on the calls, like, hey, how does this thing actually work? And we spent over 365 days doing this. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not like, hey, two week thing. This sounds great. Let's move into it. But a few deals came up, right? They didn't work out. We didn't end up getting them under contract. And then finally we landed on this one. It was the right deal. And we're like, you know what? This is what we want to partner on. Let's take this thing head on. And we're thrilled, man. It's going to be we're just excited to uh, to move forward with it. Yeah, so if you're interested, like Rye said, check out the link in our bio uh, at, Wheelie, at Weekly Juice Pod. Fill out the investor questionnaire, and we will be in touch with a cha- uh, an opportunity for us to all top on a call and you know see if it's a good fit. Yeah, the thing's under contract, so we're ready to go and uh, looking to wrap this up pretty soon. Sean, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your story, not only about what you've done in the past, recapping everybody, but just bringing this opportunity to light and... Uh, so I I was gonna I was literally about to say I look forward to staying in touch, but uh, we talk <laughs> we talk legitimately every day. Yeah. Now, so <laughs> I will text you after the episode's over. <laughs> Perfect, man. Well, guys, as always, it's an honor to be on this. You guys have one of the best podcasts out there. Lo- love, I consider myself a juicer, so love love the community you guys have created. So thanks, thank you so much, man. We really appreciate it. And for those listening, still listening, I know you probably should signed off already, but. We'll also link Sean's previous episode in the show notes so you can go back, listen to the beginning when he walks through his, a little bit more in depth on his full story. But thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in this week to the Weekly Juice Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and share with friends. The more ratings we get, the more ears we'll get on our show. And in turn, we'll be able to provide you with more high-quality guests. You can also find us on Instagram at Weekly Juice Pod, where we post daily tips and tricks and document our own journey towards financial freedom. Make sure to tune in every Wednesday to get your weekly juice.